is the way to please God. God's not interested in none of our works. He's interested in our faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. And, and those people in the Word of God that please God, pleased Him by faith. My, He begins to call off that great roll call. He starts back there in with Abel in the book of Genesis. And He said, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, his brother. You know that story over there? What a wonderful story. Abel went down there and killed that, got that blood shed. Abel knew that God demanded blood for his sins to be paid for like they're singing about a minute ago. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. And God did not accept Cain's offering, but did accept his brother Abel's offering. You ever heard the old saying, you can't get blood out of a turnip? That goes way back there to that day when Cain tried to set up his fruit stand and said, all right, God, here's the payment for my sin. And the Lord said, I ain't going to mess with it. And Cain said, look here, I'm giving you all the turnips. And the Lord said, I want blood. And you can't get blood out of one of them turnips. And old Abel come down there and you thought that was for poor people, didn't you? And uh, and Abel come over there. I believe he killed that lamb. And he took that lamb's blood and he wiped it down there. And he said, all right, God. And he threw that body in the fire. And he said, God, this is for my sin. And God went... And reached down and got that offering and received it. By faith, Abel offered unto God. And then he tells us about Enoch, that great man there in Genesis 5, that walked with God, the seventh from Adam, that walked with God, a type of the church of Jesus Christ. Enoch is a picture of the raptured church, those that are walking with God right now, that will someday be taken out of the world without dying. And the Bible said that Enoch walked was not. And they went around looking for him and couldn't find him. And somebody said, uh, where's Enoch? You've seen him? They said, I ain't seen him two or three days. Last time I seen him, him and God went walking down that road. And we asked him, did he want to go on a picnic with us? And he said, no, I'm going to go walk with God. And we tried to get him to go uh, to the ball game. He said, no, I'm going to go walk with God. He said, that we tried to get him to go with us. He said, no, I'd just soon walk with God. And he ain't never come back. The Lord probably took him out there and killed him. And they said, well, go get his body and we'll bury him. And there wasn't nowhere to be found. They come back and they said, where's Enoch? And they said, he's not. And they said, he's not what? And they said, he just not. And they said, what do you mean he's not? He's not alive? No, he's not. You mean you, you mean he's he's gone off and ain't, he's just not. He said he's not what? He said he just not nowhere to be found. He's disappeared. He's gone. And the Bible said God translated in it. And then he tells us about Noah there. And he tells, said by faith, Noah built that ark. As far as we know, it had never rained before. Noah got the word from God. And God said, no, I'm going to drown the entire population. And Noah believed God. And by faith went down there. He set his boys down. He said, all right now, boys, we're going to have to saw some logs. And I don't mean take a nap, fellas. We're going to get us some hammers and some saws. And we're going to put these big old logs on there. And we're going to pitch it inside and outside. And and we're going to build the biggest ship that the world's ever seen on dry ground. That thing was, uh, I forgot, uh, uh, twice as long as many of our great ships in the world today. As long as, longer than a football field and a half, something like that. Three stories high, higher than this building, much higher than our church that we're in here uh, this evening. And Noah built that thing on dry land with no water around. But the rain came by faith. Noah did that. And then he tells us about Abraham. God told, said that Abraham by faith went out, not knowing whether he went. Now, what about that? Can you imagine Abraham was out praying one day? And he said, Dear Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. And God spoke to him and he said, Abraham, I want you to move. And Lord, he said, Where do you want me to move to? And uh, the Lord said, Well, you just pack your clothes and head out and I'll show you one step at a time. And Abraham said, Now, Lord, are you sure this is what is this you really talking to me and the Lord said this is me really talking to you get it boy get home get packed and go rinse you a U-Haul hook it up to your camels and load up son we're leaving town and Abraham said but Lord you know Sarah she's a good woman and I love her she's the sweetest wife anybody could have but she is going to flip out if I go in there and tell her that we're moving 
and not tell her where we're moving to. I mean, these ladies, they don't like, they like security and all that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, I know, I know, I made them. And Abraham said, she's, she, she ain't going to like it if I tell her if I walk in and tell her we just, I got a good job. I'm making it good. I'm, and, and the Lord said, you're going to do this by faith, boy. And he said, yes, sir. He went in and said, oh, hi, darling. He's trying to butter her up real good, you know. And she said, you have a good day, Abraham. And Abram, you know, he was Abram at first, you know. He called him Abram for a long time. And oh, I believe it was old Billy Kelly said that he started tithing and God put the ham on. Amen. That's right. That's what God might give you some good time. And boy, he, 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 Abraham, he become Abraham. And boy, Abraham, he uh, give a tenth to the Lord there and God changed his name to Abraham. And boy, he got, he got all of that stuff. He got, he went there and he said, now, now darling, oh, Lord help me. Lord help me. She's not in a good mood. Hey, Lord, uh, uh, she don't act right. She's been working. She said, whoo, I've been working all day long. Abraham said that. Darling, I'm going to wash the dishes for you. She said, great. Day in the morning, am I dreaming? And he said, no, I'm going to wash the dishes. And he said, uh, honey, sit down. I'm going to talk to you. She said, "Uh uh-oh. Did you put a dent in that new camel? He said, no, no, nothing like that. She said, he said, honey, nothing bad's happened. I promise. He said, she, he said, I gotta tell you something. She said, what is it? And he said, now, now darling, uh, I've been talking to the Lord a little bit and the Lord has told me that he wants us to move. And she says, move? Move? What do you mean move? Where? He said, no, don't get excited, honey. Uh, it, it might be, I'm getting tired of this place anyway, ain't you? Oh, you could have a new tent and, and, uh, and, uh, 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 we'll probably have a dirt floor there, but it'd be new dirt. It wouldn't be the same color of dirt. And, and, and honey, you'd love it. Honest to goodness. I think you're, I think you, uh, you deserve better than this and all that stuff. You know, I tried to butter up. And, uh, all oh, you married me and know what I'm talking about. Amen. Boy, that was a pitifulest amen I ever heard in my life. But anyway, he, he told her that. And she said, well, darling, I don't know about this. Just what do you got on your mind? He said, well, darling, don't you worry about a thing. We'll just pack and we're going to move out. We'll be leaving here in about a week. And she said, uh, where are we moving to? You ain't going to drag me off there. You've probably been in one of them prayer meetings up there. Them boys at that church got this crazy stuff in your head like Danny Tucker or somebody. Hey, you ain't a dragging me off somewhere. And, and, and ruining my life like that. He said, now listen, darling, this is God. Yeah, it's God, all right. You boys get up there and try to act spiritual. Believe God. No, he said, God really did tell me this. And she said, Abraham, I'm telling you, boy, if this don't work, I, 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 and you know how it went. And boy, they went through that and through that. And boy, she really had a fit when he told her they did, he didn't even know where they was going. She said, what do you mean? He, you you mean we're just going to take off down the road with everything we've got piled up in suitcases? He said, that's right. She said, now listen, I don't believe God. I believe if God tells you to move, He'd tell you where you... He said, well, you can read what you want to, but God told me, and by faith, we're going. And by faith, Abraham went out not knowing whether he went. Abraham was a great man of faith. By faith, he offered Isaac. And brother, knowing that God was able to give him back to him. God had already promised him a multitude of grand youngins and then God told him to take him out and kill him. Can you imagine that night that God told him, take thy son, thine only son, and take him out there and put a knife through his body? Buddy, you talk about some faith. Abraham tied Isaac up. I've heard people think, uh, some people think maybe like, hey, oh, he knew, he knew. But I believe Abraham had every intention of plugging that knife right through that little boy's body. He knew that God was able to give him back to him. If God chose, by faith, he did all of that. And then the Bible, he told us about Isaac, who blessed Jacob and Esau. Notice how Jacob took Esau's place, even there in the Scripture. And then he tells us about Jacob, who blessed Joseph's son before he died. And then Joseph, who told them that God was going to deliver them. Oh, Joseph was a man of faith. Oh, Joseph, by faith, prophesied down there in Egypt. And he told him before he left, he said, Now, boys, he said, we're not always going to live down here. He said, God, at the appointed time, is going to get you out of Egypt's bondage. He said, God, we'll get you out of here one of these days. And he said, when God gets you out of here, he said, you go down there to my grave and dig my bones.
bones up and carry them with you wherever you're going. Take me out of Egypt. I don't want my bones left in this old sin-cursed place. And so he went out by faith. And then he told us about Moses who refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What a man of faith that was. He could have grew up in the palace of Egypt. He could have been the next heir to the throne of Egypt's land. Moses could have been ruler over the whole land. But he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Thank God for some people of faith like that. I wish we had a hundred young teenagers in here tonight that would turn your back on Egypt tonight and turn your back on this old sin-cursed world and choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's what Moses did. He said, I'm not Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter is not my mama. And boy, all he'd have had to done was kept his mouth shut and he'd have had everything a man ever wanted. But he said, I will stand for God no matter what it costs me. What a great man of faith. By faith, the people of God forsook Egypt. Excuse me. By faith, he stuck out his rod over the Red Sea and it parted and it went over on dry ground. And then he tells us about Joshua, that man of God who led the people around the walls of Jericho. And they took the walls of Jericho and they marched around it. Excuse me. Somebody give me a drink of water or something. Thank you. <clears throat> he said that they went around them walls and uh, they went around there one time each. One glass of water would be a plenty, fellas. And uh, did you know, did you know uh, they were going around those walls? They went around one time a day. Second day, one time. Third day, one time. Fourth day, one time. Fifth day, one time. Most people don't even know it. They went around them things. Third time. One time a day for six days. But on that seventh time they started bright and early. <clears throat> they went around. They went around again. They went around again. They didn't have bows and arrows. They didn't have cannons. They didn't have 30-30s. They didn't have scud missiles. They didn't have nothing but trumpets. That's all they had. And they said, Joshua, how are we going to fight a battle with no artillery? And Joshua said, when the time is right, God will fight the battle for us. And they said, oh, my soul. He said, we're doing this by faith. And brother, by faith, they walked around those walls. After that 13th time, the Lord said, all right, boys, crank them up. And they put them, them milk horns up to their mouth. And, or they, they, no, they begin to shout. I believe that's what it was. They all begin to shout. And everybody shouted and like that. I mean, they took off with shouting if it ever was. And God began to shake them walls. And they fell down flat. And the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the heart of Rahab. The Word of God tells us here. Held that string out the window. And brother, she was delivered in her family. Because she had hid the spies. When when Joshua came to Jericho, when Gideon, you know the Gideon and his 300 men, that God went that great army of thousands down to 300 men to fight that battle. Oh, what men of faith we find here in this chapter. And then there was the Barak in the book of Judges. There was Samson. A lot of people don't realize it, but Samson was a great man of faith. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> Thank you. And Samson had more faith than a lot of people realize. I understand he committed suicide, but he was still listed as one of the great heroes of the faith here in Hebrews chapter 11. And brother, Samson did great exploits in the name of the Lord. You know, a lot of people think about Samson because he had a woman problem. And sure enough, he did. But I want to tell you something, buddy. When that old boy was right, the power of God was on him. I mean, buddy, he, he, took, he took a jawbone of an ass. And a back. Can you imagine? Wouldn't you like to have seen that? I mean, wouldn't you like to have been sitting in a nearby tree limb somewhere and seen a thousand Philistines coming at him, you know, with armor on and him pick up that big jawbone and just mop that crowd up like, bow, 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 bow. 
just like that. Wouldn't that have been something? You know how he done that? He done it by faith. He tried to take old Samson down one time, and they said, keep him in town. That old buddy, he went out and picked up the gate and the bars and everything else, and just walked off with them. That old boy had the power of God on him. Amen. They've always blew the world's mind, these men and women of faith. And then the time would fail me to tell of Jephthah who made that awful bow. And when he's going to come home, you remember that story? And David, the great man who killed the giant. And Samuel. The Bible said they subdued kingdoms. That was Joshua. The Bible said they wrought righteousness. That was Micaiah and Elijah. The Bible said they obtained promises. That's Caleb and Jabez and many, many others. The Bible said they stopped the mouths of lions. Who was that? Right. The Bible said they escaped the fire. Who's that? The Hebrew children. They were the, they were killed with a sword. David escaped the sword many times. And weakness. They were made valiant. The armies of the aliens, they turned them. Some of them had their dead raised again. Like the woman there in the Old Testament in Elisha's day. And the widow of Nain. And, and Mary and Martha with Lazarus. And then they had trials of cruel mocking in bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned like Nabal and like Stephen. Can you imagine what it felt like to be stoned? Can you imagine somebody laying you down right here on these steps and then somebody getting a rock about the size of a baseball and running back and just busting you up inside the head? That's the way they done, Je- uh, that's the way they done Nabal. That's the way they done Stephen. Somebody would get a big old rock about as big as that and a couple of them would pick it up and go over there and just throw it right on you and it will begin to crush your bones and burn and slowly crush your skull until you had no life left in you whatsoever. They were stoned and then they were sawn asunder. Far as I know, there's no record in the Bible of anybody being sawn asunder. But we know it happened because the Bible said that it did. There is a Jewish tradition that says Isaiah was sawn asunder. Can you imagine stretching somebody out and taking a saw and getting on one side and getting on the other side and sawing a person's body in two? That's the way they were treated for their faith. Yet they stood for God. They were tempted. They were killed with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and caves and dens. And the, like the old song says, though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my a pillar of stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know He'll give me a mansion my own. Amen? Oh, they ought to obtain a better resurrection. Now with all of that thought in mind tonight, excuse me, <clears throat> in the great roll call of faith, I want to show you three things and I'll be through. Number one, when these people refuse deliverance, when they said, no, God, you can deliver me, but I'd really rather you not so I can shine brighter on Judgment Day. When they said that, I seen three things this evening. First thing I see is they had a strong belief in the Word of God. But if somebody would have to believe God in order to refuse deliverance. Now, I know these people here with terrible diseases all over our hospitals and... <clears throat> I'll guarantee you tonight, 100% of them, if you offered them automatic cure, would accept it. Somebody really has to have a lot of faith in God to say, no, thank you. I don't want delivered from this thing. They knew that God meant what He said. They had a strong belief that you are going to die. They said, well, see, people said, but listen, if you don't recruit your camp and deny the Lord, they're liable to kill you. These people look back and say, you're going to die anyway. <clears throat> Amen? You might as well die for Jesus. Did you know the average person nowadays does not really believe they're going to die? I was over in one of the stores in Gatlinburg the other day. I believe it was, uh, I believe it was Friday evening. And I walked in there and I tried to witness, you know, as I'm leaving. 
on most of the stores I go in, about all the stores I go in just about, I try to witness to whoever's running. And these ladies, they were trying to wait on me and trying to sell me something. And before I left, I said, now listen, don't you ladies forget. Oh, it must have been, I said something about, don't forget, Jesus loves you. And they looked at me and they said, yes, thank you, we know it, you know, and all that. And I said, one of these days we're going to die and face Him. And one woman said, thanks for coming in. And the other one said, oh, I don't believe He'll snuff us out. And I said, yeah, we're all going to die because we've all sinned. And you have to die because you've sinned. And she said, well, we die spiritually. I said, no, you're going to die physically. Did you know the average person out there in the world, the devil has them convinced that they're not going to die? You go out there tomorrow, or you go to work, or tomorrow at school, and just bring up the subject. Go up to your teacher or anybody and just say, are you ready to die? They don't want to talk about it. They say, oh, hush, hush. So, be quiet, you're crazy. You're gross, you're vulgar. All right, say so it ain't half as gross and vulgar as some of that junk you try to tell us every day. This is a fact. You're going to die. You're going to die. There ain't nothing wrong with dying for the Lord. Something's going to get you. If you get an opportunity to go out for the glory of God, these people said, we'll take it. That shows the reverse thinking between God and the world. You check out this Bible and see how different God thinks and how man thinks. God told one church in here that it was rich. And it's actually, it was poor. God told another church in Revelation that it was poor and it was really rich. God told some people they could see that were blind and told other people that could were blind they could see. God told some people, if you save your life, you'll lose it. And other people, if you lose your life, you save it. God told some people, and oh, He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. To the world, it seems like a waste of time. To the world, it seems like a waste of a life to go out and die in the cause of Jesus. But in God's sight, that's the greatest honor that an individual can have. They know you're going to die. And they know something else. They knew you was going to be raised. They knew that death don't end it all. They said, hey, not only are we going to die, we ain't going to stay down there. And we want to come up better when we do come up. That's pretty smart people. I'm amazed nowadays. We brag about all of our technology and how far advanced we are. This is probably the dumbest group of people to ever live, spiritually speaking. Eastern religions, Satanism has never seen a greater day in America tonight. And people don't even think about the day they're going to be raised and stand before God. I heard about years ago in Greece, back in the days when they tortured Christians, they said that they, they um, built this great coliseum for the emperor. And they had this Greek architect to design this great building. Finally, the building was completed and finished. And dedication day come. And they had him there. And they were going to honor him for designing such a wonderful, magnificent coliseum as that. He was all there. The emperor was there. The people were there. And to honor him, they did the greatest thing of entertainment was bring out some Christians who would not deny their faith and throw them to the lines. Now, it's just like we're crazy over football. We like boxing. We want to see blood run. It got so bad in those days, they said, boy, it just looked good to see a lion just tear somebody all to pieces. And they hated Christians, so they would bring Christians out and throw them to the lines. And when they dedicated that great Colosseum that day, the emperor was there, the Greek architect was there, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, in order to de dedicate this great building, we're going to dedicate it and show our respect to the great architect who designed it? And he said, we're going to bring out some Christians and throw them to the line. They brought out the Christians. They were getting ready to throw them to the line. And all of a sudden, the Greek architect stopped and, and grew up his hand and said, Stop! Stop! 
And they said, what do you want? He said, I too am a Christian. I'm a child of God. And I'm not going to sit here and let my brothers be thrown to the lions and me just stand here and be quiet. And brother, they threw him to the lions and his body was torn to shreds. He knew that he's going to die and he knew that he would be raised. And he said, I'll have a better resurrection and I'll give my life for the cause of Christ. The rich and famous that they brag about now in the world have nothing on the child of God. Can you imagine God one of these days up in heaven? I just thought of this. I ain't never thought of this before. It just hit my mind right then. Up in heaven one day, let's say the Lord puts up a big old screen. And that screen's about a thousand miles square. And He sets down millions of people in heaven and says... I got a movie on chance to watch. And people say, What is it, Lord? He said, Well, the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Except this time you're going to see it like it really is. Yeah, and they'll say, What? And boy, all of a sudden the camera's going to flash and light's going to come on and it's going to be in 3D. And, and the Lord's going to say, uh, And somebody's going to come on there and they're going to say, um, Oh, I don't know. <clears throat> they'll say, This is Joshua. Here's Joshua's mansion that he lives in. And boy, that thing going to shine. Everybody's going to go, wow! And we're going to say, all Joshua has to do is go, Bink, and he can be in other planets. All he has to do is go, Bink, and he can be anywhere he wants and do anything he wants. And they're going to go, wow! Here's some old Christian down here that never did do nothing for God. Never did do nothing for the Lord. Wouldn't visit. Wouldn't give out a track. Wouldn't pray. Wouldn't read the Bible. They just said, well, I don't care care about no rewards. I just want to barely get in. And the Lord's going to set them down and say, the lifestyle of them that shine bright and glory. And boy, He's going to show them there. Everybody's going to ooh and ah. I don't know if that's really going to happen. But somehow or another, they're going to have a better resurrection. Somehow or another, they're going to shine brightly and glory. Listen, you can waste your life and fool around and fool around. Be saved by the grace of God. But waste your life. and But then you can do it another thing, you can say, I'm going to make my life count for God. I'm going to leave my track on this wall. I'm going to take everybody I can to heaven with me. And by one day, you'll have a better resurrection. You'll shine. You say, oh, that don't mean thing to me, preacher. All I want to do is get there. You're just, you're just saying that because you don't want to do nothing. It'll mean something to you then. It'll mean something to you then. The second thing I saw this evening... It showed that they put the emphasis on the soul and not on the body. Boy, we're living in a day when the emphasis is on the body. Lord have mercy. If I wasn't a preacher and I wasn't a Christian, I'd tell you how to get rich. I can tell you if you want to. All you got to do is do something to make people's flesh look better. I mean, you get makeup, tanning beds, aerobics, anything to make you fit. Hey, hey, listen, you can invent something to lose weight, make people lose weight and still do whatever they want to. You'd be a millionaire in a month. We're living in a day when people put all the emphasis on the body. i never seen the beat in my life. You look at the magazine rack. The magazine's called Self, Image, You. Be all you can be. You, 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 you. Don't worry, do what you want. You deserve it. Try some Chung King for your beautiful body. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, listen. I mean, all the emphasis now is you, 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 you. Boy, you know, we're lifting weights. And we're running. And we're jogging. And there's Richard laying around in the flogging. Five, two, three, four. La gag. Lord in mercy. He looks like one of them things my daddy used to clean a shotgun with. You stick it down in there and just, that little wire in there and clean it. Clean the barrel out. My, my, my. Listen, here, I all you got to do to get rich is help people lose weight, live longer, and, 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 and get Put them in the right. You've seen these women weightlifters. Lord, in mercy, that ain't the sickness looking thing I ever seen. Who in the world? 
I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, I think y'all, I mean, I like to run. I, need, I like to exercise. But great day, people, that ain't the most important thing in the world. Your body ain't the most important thing. It's your soul. It's your soul. It's your soul. They put the emphasis on your soul, not on your body. Good night. Can you imagine these, these girls come in? Man, them th- I don't see what men would want with some. They look like a frog you pull the skin off of. They grease them down, you know. And uh, like that, you know. You wouldn't want your wife to look like that, would you? You know, she comes in with a boom, or she flip her. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'll eat it right now. Who in the world wants somebody like that? They put the emphasis on the body and not on the soul. These people that I read you about to get a resurrection, they put the emphasis on the soul, not on the body. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Hebrew children over there when Jesus comes and walks down and does a pre, pre-New Testament incarnate experience there, chose them out of a crowd of people and walks in the fire and starts untying that rope off their hand and then turn around and say, Never mind, Jesus, just let us burn up so we can have a better resurrection. Can you imagine? God speaking to the whale and say, Whale, spit him up! And Jonah said, I'm going to hang on to his guts. I'm going to stay in here. I'm not accepting deliverance so I can obtain a better resurrection. You don't find them like that often, do you? Most of God's people are working and squirming and beating their head trying to get out of the problems they're in. When a lot of times, if we had the faith we ought to have and put the emphasis on the soul and not on the body, we'd just say, All right, God... Just let me suffer. Just let me suffer. So I can shine brighter on the day of judgment. It's getting quiet. We're on holy ground when you start talking about people like that. The third thing, and this is last and I'm through, they put the emphasis on eternity, not on time. I think you should take care of your body. Don't get me wrong. But you're... In a re- better resurrection, they made this decision thinking in the future. You know, you don't find many people that can think ahead. Most people make their decisions on what I want to do right now. You don't find very people smart enough and with enough patience to say, Hey, what will I wish I'd done a hundred years from now? Well, if we'd make our decision... Like, how am I going to wish I'd done this thing a million years later? But wouldn't it change our decisions we make? Now, don't, don't just die on me tonight. I mean, this is convicting me as much as it is you. I studied this thing out this way. I rolled this over my mind. I thought, Lord, we're so far back, Slid. We ain't even in the same league with these people. How many Christians you know like that? We think we're really doing good. Come to church three times a week. How many Christians you know say, just let me suffer, Lord. I just drug you not deliver me. Let me die for you. Whew. The rewards were greater. More glory to God. And more things to shout about when they get a million years later. They took a man that they were going to kill as a martyr. Now, everybody in here knows what a martyr is, I trust. The word martyr originally just meant witness. Then they started killing the Christians for witnessing, and the word martyr took on a new meaning, and the word martyr come to to mean this. Here's what martyr means. It means somebody that sealed their testimony with their blood. They shed their blood for their testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you know something tonight? He's getting ready to kill this old boy one time. And he's getting ready to, he's going to become a martyr. And one of the soldiers looked at him and said, Man, you're crazy. All you have to do is recant. You know, that means deny the Lord. They, they always, you've read Fox's Book of Martyr and all that. They said, Just recant and you won't lose your life. They said, Don't you know that life is sweet and death is bitter? And the man looked back at him and he said, True. But the life to come is more sweet and the death to come more bitter. They thought about eternity and not time. 
We're like this. Oh God, just get me out of this mess. God, just, it don't matter what happens, just get me out of it. We need to put our thoughts on eternity and not time. Many years ago, and I'll give you this and I'm through. The Boxer Rebellion in China. They captured a hundred students from a mission. Young people mostly. They said, we're going to give you a choice, Christians. They said, we're going to lay down this cross. And every student that will trample that cross, the sign of their Savior, you can go free and live a happy life. Every student that will not trample that cross will face the firing squad and be shot. The first one come up, scared out of his wits, trampled the cross. The first seven came up and trampled the cross. But the eighth person was a little girl, a young lady. And she come up and she thought about Jesus dying for her. And she thought many, many years ago, on a hill far away, my Savior died on an old cross like that. And she said, God, give me strength. And she wouldn't walk on it. She went around it and kneeled down and said, God, strengthen me. Strengthen me. And that little girl went around and they said, all right. She went out to face the firing squad. She'd have a better resurrection. And the thing about it was, folks, that so gripped those other 92 Christians that the next 92 went around it and followed that little girl's steps. She didn't even know what an example she said. See, when you live for God and stand for the Lord, you not only obtain a better resurrection yourself, you encourage other Christians coming behind you to take a stand. You know, a lot of times when I get in a tight spot, I think of men who have been through hard times, and I think, praise God, they made it, I can make it. I've had people tell me, they say, Brother Danny, I've had to face what you face, and I, my, you come to my mind, and I thought, well, if Brother Danny can do it, I can do it. You don't know how many people are following you. We ought to get our minds on eternity and not so much on time so we can obtain a better resurrection. Let's stand by our hands. Now tonight, I don't really know what kind of an invitation to give. But I do feel like God's dealt with our hearts tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I'll talk to you in just a minute. We're going to give an invitation. Maybe there's somebody here that you've never come to the point in your life where you just said, all right, God, it don't matter what I do, what I get, what I have. What matters shining bright on Resurrection Day. Whew, glory to God. Do you care or not, Christian? Does that bother you? Oh, as many people are already filling these altars tonight, we ought to just have an old time of prayer. Just say, God, help me to get my mind off things. My body! Get my mind on my soul once again. Dear God, help us tonight. Bless our church. Lord, I know that we're in a materialistic age. We're in a generation that is consumed with thoughts about material things, life, health, body, me, me, I, I. God help us to be like these Christians of old. My, 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 my. Die for thee if come this. Lord, help it not just to be words, but put it deep down in our hearts. No, oh God, let us die. For you. Let us live our life for you. And do whatever's necessary that we might obtain a better resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray and for Jesus' sake. Amen.